can I ask Mina if she would like to give us the background to the project and then we can move straight into the first question which I know Mina would like to raise, Mina and Laura would like to raise with you. Mina, it's over to you. Okay, great. Um, hello everyone, it's very nice to see uh, many familiar and unfamiliar faces. Uh, this is our final event today to the EU-funded project iRead. The project has run over the past four and a half years, and its primary aim was to develop new personalized technology for primary school uh, children's literacy learning. The project involved 15 university practitioner and industry partners from eight different countries. Led by the UCL Knowledge Lab based at the Institute of Education, I had the pleasure to coordinate the project during this period. Many members of our team from UCL are here today. As well as members from our wider project and teachers who have used the technology that we developed as part of the iRead project. So as I am giving this introduction, can I please ask those who were involved in some way uh, in the iRead project to introduce themselves and say hello in the chat box. So today's session will be facilitated um, by um, our collaborator Lernus, uh, myself, and also one of the researchers who has been involved from the very start of uh, the project, uh, Laura Benton. Our focus is going to be on the flagship technology of the iRead project, which is a literacy game called Navigo. Laura, if we can go to the next slide, please. So within this session, what we're going to do is explore three topics that have been researched in relation to game-based learning. Either myself or Laura will be introducing you to each topic and a snapshot of the research uh, that has been reported in the past. We're then going to be joined by some key teachers from three schools who have used Navigo during this period and who are going to be sharing their stories on each topic so that we can bring uh, reflections from the classroom in this uh, discussion. We will then open the floor to invite our teacher attendees as well as practitioners who were involved uh, in the iRead project but maybe have also used games in the past to share any relevant experiences they want to raise. Laura, can we please move to the next slide? So before we start, let's have a quick look though at Navigo to kind of contextualize the discussion for today. Navigo is a literacy uh, game that teaches primary school children basic skills in relation to word decoding, morphology, as well as syntax. It was designed for three different learner groups in the primary uh, school age range children who are just learning how to read. In the UK, these would be children in years one to three. Older children who may struggle uh, with reading once the formal instruction has finished. In the UK, again, this would be typically children across years four to six, and also children who are learning English as a foreign language. Navigo is also available in, uh, besides English, in Spanish, uh, German, and Greek. Next slide, please. So since 2019 until um, this month, more than 3,500 children have been using Navigo in six different countries. And especially in this last period of the project, one of the most important accomplishments of our project and all of our partners collectively has been the work we have done with teachers in supporting them in different ways and also learning from them in how to use a literacy game like Navigo as part of literacy and language, lear language learning teaching. Next slide, please. So let me contextualize Navigo a little bit more so that we can see uh, some of the design characteristics of the games. The game is set in an Egyptian context. The child's mission there is to find their missing grandma who has lost her way in a pyramid. 
Therefore, the child's avatar is the hero within the game. Next slide, please. Each time the child enters the pyramid, he or she plays a series of game activities that are personalized to the particular profile of the child. And these activities are designed to foster their literacy learning. Next slide. The more the child plays, the more villagers that have also been lost in the pyramid, the child is able to rescue until he or she reaches the grandma. Along the way to reward the child's efforts, every few games the child plays, new items are released in a treasure chest that can be then used to customize their own avatar. So their hero in the game. In addition to this, to indicate to the player their in-task performance, the game presents on the bottom left hand corner, some gems that can be earned or lost depending on the child's gameplay. Next slide. There are a number of instructional supports that each of these game activities embedded in Navigo um, include. First of all, when the child starts to play a game, they always receive a verbal tutorial on how to play it. In addition to this, there are clear instructions at the start of each game activity that inform the child uh, player what they need to do in the task. And if the child makes a mistake, there is visual feedback to indicate their error, so to bring awareness to that, but also a verbal hint that indicates how the player can go on to uh, correct the error. So this is my short introduction to the iRead project and to Navigo. And with this, I will pass on to Laura, who is going to be introducing to us our first topic. On to you, Laura. Thanks, Mina. Okay, let me just switch presentations quickly. Okay. So the first question that we wanted to debate uh, today is what is the role of the technology versus the teacher and do children need external support when playing learning games? I will start by briefly introducing some of the theoretical ideas and evidence from the literature before passing over to one of our partner teachers from Irie who can talk about these ideas from the classroom perspective. So one of the common claims about learning games is they can foster children's independent learning. And there are a number of key aspects which enable this. Um, instructional supports, which are inbuilt into the game, give children additional instruction and help with their learning. Instant feedback on their actions so children know how well they're doing. And also um, some games use adaptivity, um, which can provide personalized learning experiences to match a child's particular needs and preferences, which is um, something that Navigo incorporated. Instructional supports in games might appear in the form of training videos, a pedagogical helper character, advice or hints, worked examples. Um, research has shown that uh, the importance of these supports, particularly for novice learners. However, the design and integration of support can impact the engagement of the game, what is known as the flow state, depending on if they're more of an add-on support or if they're integrated into the narrative. And our own research has also highlighted the importance of making connections between different elements of instruction as, instructional support, such as between the pre-training and the feedback. Feedback is a type of instructional support and education research has shown that it provides a powerful role in raising achievement. Games are particularly good at providing instant or in the moment feedback. The literature classifies different types of feedback such as outcome which tells you whether you got the answer right or wrong and elaborative which gives you more information such as why the answer was right or wrong or a strategy to recover from an error. Elaborative feedback is being shown to be particularly beneficial for learning. 
However, in our own research, we've seen um, that the importance of this elaborative feedback needs to be designed carefully to ensure that children are really understanding the content of the feedback. And we even observed cases where children were not aware that this feedback was being delivered to them. Recent work has exploited developments in adaptivity to provide a more personalized learning experience in games. It's possible to adapt different dimensions of games, such as the content, the way that the learning is assessed, and also the sequencing of different activities. And this enables the tailoring of the game to a wide range of student needs or preferences. But since it's still a relatively new area um, in games, there's limited amount of evidence that demonstrates the benefit of adaptive games over non-adaptive games, which in part is due to the challenges in designing these types of games and knowing what and how to adapt to benefit the learning. In order to realise our promise, learning games need to be well designed and informed by research literature, which often is not the case. In our work, evaluating a range of learning games, we commonly encountered usability problems which can result in um, children experiencing action breakdowns. For example, dragging a correct answer to an incorrect position on the screen, which would register as um, them getting it wrong. Mm -hmm. We've seen uh, children often use a trial and error strategy uh, within certain types of games, and this can enable them to progress through brute force alone. And we've also observed a particular gap in supporting children to recover from errors. So all of these things can disrupt children's learning within a game and it suggests a need for some kind of external support like um, a teacher could provide. During our final pilot interviews, a year one teacher reflected on her role in supporting the game and how she would use prompting questions such as, what's the sound it's asking you to find? What's the word that you need to look for? to check if they're not just using trial and error to make progress within the game. So now we want to take a view from the classroom. So I'd like to invite Nessa and Query, who's assistant head and one of our um, IRE partner teachers at Jubilee Primary School in East London. And he'll um, speak for a few minutes about his experience of um, this area and being involved in the IREAD project. So Nessa, over to you. I think you're on mute. I think uh, the person who's meant to be speaking needs to unmute themselves. No, it, it is unmuted, it's not working, unfortunately. Okay, so I think while Nesson works on that, maybe we can just open it up for any questions no. on what's been said so far. I apologize, I disappeared for a short while but my internet dropped. Can you believe it? The wrong time. Okay, any, any particular questions that anybody um, has, has so far? Can, I think I... Nesson, do you want to try again? Connecting to audio. No, 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 they don't fall. I've got home. Am I coming through now? Yes, you are, Nessa. Oh, okay, okay. over to you. Well done. Well okay. Done. okay, apologies. Well done. Okay. So, no worries. I was asked to speak for a couple of minutes on uh, the experience we've had with automated learning, which I read and Navigo comes into. Okay. Uh, so I've got a couple of things to say that it, we yeah. don't use it as, and then 10 key benefits we find uh, uh, automated learning, as we refer to it as. So first of all, we don't use it in the classroom to support teaching. It's generally um, stuff that the pupils do on their own, the automated learning and the learning games. And it's not, from our angle, 
to take the place of teaching. Um, it's the teaching, in our opinion, I imagine most people, it's to be done by human beings. And these are programs for people to go over already learned material, the consolidation and for fluency. Okay, so very quickly, the 10 key benefits we find of their programs, such as Naviga Wire of which we have about seven that we like to use. Uh, first of all, it's been touched on already by Laura, it's individualized. So if they know something, it doesn't give them again. If they don't know it, it keeps giving them it until they know it. Number two, instant feedback, which I'm sure the academics and lots of other people will know is possibly the most beneficial thing to the children to know straight away if they got it right or wrong. I was whizzing around a maths class today, feeling very proud of myself, giving feedback to about half the class, thought through, got through loads, but on an automated program, it's like that for every pupil as soon as they give an answer. And number three, I think it's been touched on already, that people find it highly motivating and fun. When you say to the class, we're doing our spellings, and they all go, yay! You're kind of halfway there, aren't you? Uh, number four, the easy monitoring of engagement and performance, really helpful for our homework to quickly monitor who's um, logged on and how they're doing, much easier than flipping through a load of books. Uh, number five, um, financially, financial efficiency. Unfortunately, we have less and less money uh, for human beings to be running catch-up and interventions presently, and this is something that, to an extent, uh, can fill those holes for, for rehearsing material or they taught, not for introducing new material. Um, number six, it can enable catch up. So we've had spent lots of time giving pupils who are behind easier work that they work through more slowly and they don't catch up. Uh, we have automated learning programs now that if, if we're able to give the time in school and slash or if home are really engaged, we have homes where we're able to get their children catching up, let's say for argument's sake, um, a year or so's maths in two and a half years when they have access to these programmes. Um, it suits a variety of learning styles. If you, for people who buy into that, it's automatically visual, auditory, kinesthetic. Um, it can turn number seven, it can turn negative screen time into positive screen times. There's homes where we know we're the best will in the world. And I'm not hugely judgmental about this. Um, certain families have lots of difficulties on the plates, but we know kids are going to go home and be thrown in front of the screen. And we have found that some of those um, children coming in with really wonderful uh, math scores, much improved spelling scores, because we've turned some of the, what I would deem negative screen time into more positive screen time. Number eight is benefits we've seen for children with special educational needs. We've seen some children with, um, I don't like the phrase, but high functioning autism. Let's say children with autism who are generally accessing the curriculum close to their peers. Uh, get really into some of our automated learning programs and make huge progress. And the last benefit, key benefit we find is a reduction in paper-based systems and the environmental and logistical uh, benefits of that. Um, that's it, our end, Laura, if that's okay. Brilliant. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, any, anybody got any questions they want to ask Nesson? If not, I'm going to jump in with one. Uh, Nesson, what made you decide to use it outside class time rather than as part of normal lessons? It may come into normal uh, normal lesson times, uh, to be honest. it's We use it generally as a catch-up material. So in school, in lessons is more the, the mainstream, should we say, of that year group's cur curriculum. So we would not be averse to, I could, could I, I mean, the example I gave before of me whizzing around the maths class, feeling very pleased with myself, getting a third of the questions marked, could I see um, a situation in what's say two, three years time where that's being done and the pupils are working on it on a computer and getting instant feedback on the maths? Yeah, I could easily see that. We wouldn't be averse to that. It's more, um, and more I suppose, Derek, we're feeling our way in with this kind of stuff as well. You, you, you would know we're not gonna launch a new initiative is something as big as that without giving it a good old try and test. So probably for those reasons, if that answers your question. Yeah, that's helpful. Any, anybody else, please do put your hand up or put something in the chat. Yeah, I've got a question for Nesson, please. 
Uh, hi, I'm Kevin. Thanks, everyone. It's great. Um, I'm curious about how the children's perception is of these games in relation to other games they might play or other um, kind of mobile games or other sort of things they do. So, like, um, do you think the children think this is like, as if they had a choice between a game of their choice and this game, would they pick the would they pick the kind of like the sort of like non educate non educational game, or to put it another way, like, um, do they? Um, yeah, actually, I can't think of a better way. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I, I totally do. I was hoping you'd think a bit longer because I can't think of... Um, <laughs> l l is, is this any good to you? Let me say, um, let me give the educational ones 30% versus the non-educational ones 70%. As in, the, the, there is some, hey, these guys went home last night and batted out a load of spellings as opposed to Fortnite. There's a whole lot of not that. So I would say, is it... No, it's 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 edging in there, and there's, there's some households. There are households, uh, Kevin, where I know they could go home and be battering out Fortnite for two hours, uh, and they haven't done that. They've gone home and you know batted it out for maybe one and a half or something. So it is edging in there, but I, I would not say that they they are picking these over those. That's cool. Thanks, Nelson. You're welcome. Can I jump in there quickly? Yes, uh, that Andrew. Uh, yes, so Drew. Preferably, I, I, oh, I be formal. Formal. Um, so um, I led the development of Navigo, um, and we we run. A, I'm, I'm a games designer by uh, by my trade, um, and been doing it for over twenty years now. And I run Fish in a Bottle, who developed Navigo. Um, and it's if we're getting a thirty seventy percent, that's a massive win. Um, so if you look at uh, the budgets that we have for developing games like this compared to the budget that someone like Epic has for Fortnite, um, so Ep Epic's into the hundreds of millions and uh, we're not close. So if I can tempt a kid away from Fortnite for half an hour, I'm doing pretty well. Um, so that's that's really good. That's I, really good. Thanks, thanks Stuart. And not, not to you down your part in this oh no 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 but, but, but if i'm thinking why hang, hang on why have they tempted away yes uh they're, they're cool and good games including your own uh but also if they suppose if they know they're going to come into the school and and get a big up in front of the rest of the class for their performance on that and if we can make that a cool thing around the school then that that's yeah. part of what's going on there thanks Drew. okay J just just one more question before we move on to the next section is from claire do children understand the concept of the Egyptian setting? Or is that a barrier? Uh, no, it, it wouldn't be a barrier. They understood that they were rescuing the grandmother and were keen and motivated to do that. Um, other G Egyptian elements, um, I'm not too sure. It didn't come across as, as a bar it, no, it wasn't a barrier as in what, what's going on here, what's a pyramid, why am I running around here? No, whether they'd studied that in school or not, I think kids were easily familiar with the concept of uh, Egyptians, um, hieroglyphics, etc. Well, brilliant. Thanks. That's really helpful. Well, Laura, do you want to move on to the next question? Or is it Mina, this one? Mina. Over to Mina. It's Mina. Yeah. Over okay. to Mina. So Laura will share again my slide deck. So the second topic that we're going to be looking at is around games and motivation. So this Egyptian context is going to come back into our discussion. So um, let's give Laura a moment to put up the slide deck and see what the literature shows. No pressure, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Great, thank you. We can move maybe to the second slide. Okay, so what I'd like to do is review some of the literature again in the games-based uh, learning domain and try to unpack uh, some of the discussions around how games facilitate motivation. So the literature shows that motivation um, depends on whether the learner is experiencing an optimal level of challenge in the gameplay that they're encountering. Games like Navigo uh, often achieve this level of challenge by learning about the child's skill through different indicators of their game performance. 
um, and adjusting then either the content or also sometimes the instructional design. So for example, in Navigo, what we do is we have a progression uh, that the child is, um, is moving along that is very much informed uh, by this um, adaptive approach as we discussed before as well. Moving on to our next slide, I'd like to uh, look at um, this con concept of fantasy. Uh, so the fantasy world within the games has also been connected to motivation. Um, a fantasy concept a context is one that doesn't exist in the real world. So the player can experience a situation that doesn't have an impact uh, or real consequences in their world. And a point that is often uh, drawn in the literature is the importance of making this fantasy context as endogenous as possible to the learning content. So the two, uh, the context and the content are very much aligned. This is particularly challenging though to achieve in many educational games, not least because of their scale. Uh, for example, in Navigo, we have more than 900 games just in the English version, and it, as well as the diversity of the learning tasks. So moving on, this is where rewards in particular can be brought in to facilitate motivation. Rewards are important, not only in the context of games and motivation, but also to foster learning in domains that repeat, need repeated practice and training, such as reading, where the learner needs to have a lot of exposure over time uh, repeatedly to acquire the skill. Game rewards uh, can be designed in different ways. For example, they can be points, uh, items that the player earns to customize the world or their avatar, or even earning new abilities that then give them new possibilities and choices in the game. Depending on how these rewards are designed, they can also have some informational value. Uh, for example, by showing to the child what areas of learning they have mastered. So looking more closely now at the empirical work, um, there have been some concerns over rewards and their impact on intrinsic motivation. So this is the motivation of the learner uh, to carry out the task independently and their own interest in a particular learning task. So drawing from uh, theories of motivation, one hypothesis has been that rewards can limit the autonomy of the learner and di diminish their interest in their learning by putting too much emphasis on this extrinsic reward. Moving on to the next slide, if intrinsic motivation is what we should strive to foster um, in learning and to, to maintain it as much as possible. With this assumption in mind, some of, this, some of the research that has happened has been looking at the relationship between game rewards and intrinsic motivation. And whereas some studies have shown that game rewards can undermine it, other research has shown that motivation was not undermined, nor was the interest to pursue future learning. So the, the evidence is mixed. And moving to the, to the next slide, um, it seems that the research seems to show that in fact, rewards can be beneficial to motivation and learning, but under certain conditions, which are important to recognize uh, across these different studies. So for example, Rewards are beneficial when the task is not that interesting to the students because they provide that additional motivational force. Uh, rewards also are, uh, have benefits when the task gives uh, the learner the opportunity to improve uh, in their next uh, try. So this could be taken to suggest that depending on the profile of the student and how they process the task, the impact of rewards can differ from child to child. And work by Ronimus and colleagues on a uh, literacy game called Grapho Game found that there was no long-term impact on how rewards increased, on whether rewards really increased engagement and interest in children who struggled to read. So part of their reflection as to why this happened 
was a speculation on how the overall game design contributed to this. So one of the points that they discuss is that, in fact, the game, uh, the Grafo game didn't have a long-term goal within the gameplay. The only goal was to earn the rewards. So the takeaway for me is that the impact of rewards and motivation not only depends on the learner, but also on the game and how the game task is designed. So rewards can be interpreted in different ways, depending on these factors. And I'd like to finish this little review by, um, by actually pointing out that uh, gameplay is not just the interaction between game design and child. In some of our own work, we have shown that when games are played in the classroom, the rewards that the child earns become part of a dialogue between children that fosters their motivation, but also this dialogue opens up children to share their learning process. And this is particularly important for tutors or other children to come in and help. So rewards in other wor words can be facilitative of social interaction. And uh, this takes us to uh, the quote that Laura um, has on screen um, here from one of our teachers who was sharing how, how they perceived their classroom of year three and four children engaging with Navigo. So what this teacher was saying is that the children loved the game. They, brought, they bought into the story. So here we're talking about the game fantasy. Uh, they're trying to rescue the grandma and uh, they were very much immersed in, in that part of the game. So with this, I would like to uh, hand over it now to one of our teachers from Eleanor Palmer, uh, Lacey Cousins, who is going to be sharing with us some stories from her classroom and how children interacted with Navigo in relation to, to this theme of motivation. On to you, Lacey. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Lacey. So I teach a year two class at Eleanor Palmer. We're uh, in Camden, northwest London. Um, and just to give you some context, we used the game. Everyone in the class um, accessed the game. Um, we used it on a kind of as part of a carousel of activities during our reading time. So children would um, kind of vary between reading with adults um, or completing kind of tasks. And, and I read uh, and Navigo was, was part of that carousel of activities. Um, I think we can all agree that children, um, you know, fundamentally enjoy online games. Um, there's been a huge increase in online activity, particularly over the last 18 months. Um, and I think it's great that programs like this exist that can really maximize the learning that the children are doing. The children here at Eleanor Palmer were all motivated um, and really engaged by the game. They all really enjoyed it. I think that the optimal level of challenge was met. Um, it, as, as we've talked about, it ensured that the children progressed at a rate that was suitable to them. And it meant that it was, um, it always felt accessible. So all of the children in the class could always access um, the activities that were presented to them and it kept them coming back. They enjoyed the challenge of it, but also they really enjoyed the sense of achievement that they got even from using the game for a short period of time on a week to week basis. So for example, um, the children, there are some children in my class that um, still struggle with reading um, and they enjoyed the repetition and the success that it gave them um, in kind of repeating um, words and activities over and over again. Whereas children that are much more confident readers that are now reading kind of beyond the expectations for year two still really felt motivated because they were constantly presented with kind of new activities um, and new you know areas that they can explore so that was great um, in terms of the context of the game it was particularly well suited to our learners um, when the project was introduced to them during their time in year one the children were actually studying the ancient greeks and many of them believed that the game had been specifically designed for us as a class and so that was fantastic for them um, although that kind of uh, motivation has continued now into year two, even though we've actually um, looked at the ancient Greeks this year, they did question when their new game was going to come and when the Greek version would appear, but they still enjoyed it all the same. Um, so that was that was great. I think um, in terms of rewards and customization, as we've talked about, it's really important to get the balance right. 
The children certainly aspire to earn points and to kind of make changes in their avatars. Um, but actually, I think that the game was really well balanced in the sense that they actually enjoyed, you know, simply knowing that they'd, um, you know, they'd answered a question correctly and that they'd achieved, um, you know, different steps in the game. None of them were particularly motivated in terms of wanting to earn more or buy more things. And so I think that was really well presented um, in the game and that they did actually have the um, intrinsic motivation that we've discussed. I think the social aspect of the game was really important. The children liked that they were playing alongside their peers. They liked that everyone was accessing it in the class. Um, and again, just to provide some context, I, I also used the programme last year with a group of year four and year three children. And I don't think it was as motivated, they weren't as motivated there because it was a select group rather than the whole class. So actually doing it with the whole class seemed to work a lot better. Um, it was also great that they were unaware of the content that each other's, that, that, you know, the rest of them were accessing. So although mm. many of them had different um, questions, but they would never, they were never aware of that. As far as they were concerned, they were all playing the same game at the same rate, you know, at the same pace of questioning. And so I think, again, that's another real design strength. I liked the fact that there wasn't a kind of leaderboard or comparison chart as features in lots of other kind of motivational um, and educational games at the moment. Um, and that, that's, that's pretty much it from me. Um, I, I just at, actually, um, I, I will, will touch on, sorry, one of the questions that was in the chat a little bit earlier. Um, I have a child in my class that has Down syndrome um, who, who accessed the, the game you know, in a very positive way. I think for um, learners with Down syndrome, repetition and, and kind of, you know, constantly over learning um, is really important in terms of expanding their vocabulary. And the child in my class certainly has a really good decoding ability, um, but her comprehension can, can you know, can struggle. And, and a game, you know, like I read has been really beneficial for her and she was really motivated in playing it um, and experienced, you know, some real success with it. Sorry, just touch on that one. Brilliant, Lacey. That, you took the words out of my mouth. That was the question I was going to draw your attention to. Oh, okay. well, that's... <laughs> so well done. That saves me. But there is also another interesting one going on in the chat about ethics and children getting hooked on some of these games. I don't know whether that's diverging too much, but Kevin, Davidson, would you like to uh, just explain your point? Yeah, I don't really... Um, I just... I don't really, I'm not trying to say something, I'm just curious. So I'm researching um, the, un, the dark underbelly of the games industry with loot boxes and particular mechanics, which uh, evidence shows are linked to problematic gambling and addictive behaviour. And I think what, what I really like about what you're doing is it really teases out what makes these things work and what, what makes them positive for people and what makes them not positive. So um, Jane McGonigal talks about how if a game is embedded within a social fabric, then it's more likely to be positive for the people who play. And so a toxic gaming situation, for example, is when you have people you don't know, you have no relationship with, and you're engaged in like a game with. Whereas what you've got here is a whole group of people who already have pre-existing relationships who are then engaging with some of this stuff uh, and in a really positive way. And I think that's really helpful for me because it helps me to tease out like using some of these mechanics can be positive if we're using them within a social fabric. So that's why I'm sort of taken away from it. Yeah. That, 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 I think if I understood it right, was effectively what Mina was starting to say, wasn't it? Yes, you, uh, you're talking about the kind of the social interaction. The social interaction, okay. yes. Yes, which I think uh, Lacey also t touched upon. And I was actually wondering, because we've, we've gotten so many rich stories from the teachers that we've interviewed, I wondered if there was anyone else who wanted to say anything about this topic of motivation and what they observed in their classrooms when, when using Navigo. Do speak up or oh, stick your hand up. Or indeed any of our partners who might be present here and want to. Mina. Yes, hi, Stephanie. Uh, this is Stephanie, hello. Uh, do, uh, is your question about the rewards, uh, the, the rewards linked to motiva motivation, or is it more generally and maybe about the format of the game? 
I suppose what what I, what were uh, what would be interesting is to share some of your experiences, Stephanie, maybe from your side in your year two class that you used Navigo around motivation. What was it that motivated children? Did you what did you observe? Okay, so so let me. So my name is Stephanie Harris, and I am a, an NQT teacher in year two in a school which uh, I believe is quite unique uh, in, in England, in maybe even in Europe. It's a state school which is bilingual. So we have half of the week to teach English. We have two and a half days. Each class has two teachers, one English teacher, for two and a half days, and another one from the language stream. It can be French, Spanish or German for two and a half days. And I'm just giving you this, I'm just giving this information as context for the amount of time that we have available to us to, to teach English. Um, and in terms of what I have observed uh, in relation with the motivation of the children, the children, as, as per everybody who's been speaking already, absolutely adore Navigo. And what I found interesting was, um, that I've been able to see how they reacted around playing Navigo versus playing another game. Now, I'm not talking about Fortnite or um, Super Mario. I don't know how they would react, which one they would choose. But I'm thinking about other games which are available uh, online for free, for instance, to teach phonics. And I think Navigo, is my personal uh, perception, is very clever uh, in the design of the game because it looks like Fortnite. It looks like a real video game when you go from one room to another, you move from one platform or from one world in inverted comma to another, as opposed to the other games that have been available to me, which some children have played with, which are very good educational games, but which are less subtle in that the children see through. They, they see this is an educational game. This is not a video game. So I've had children tell me, no, I don't want to play that game. I want to play Navigo. And although they couldn't necessarily say it in their own words, I could tell that this is because Navigo looked very much like the video games they may be playing at home um, in opposition to other games available to them. And this is something I've, um, we, we never, we, we have used Navigo on a regular basis, but we have very little time available to us at Europa. But this is something that really came across very strongly and that I, I thought to myself, wow, whoever designed this game, I've really thought it through. And you are fooling these children, which is super, it's really great to see because they absolutely adore playing this and they're reading and they're doing work. So it's wonderful. Thank you, Stephanie. I also see another hand. I can only see the hands in the videos. I think Roger wants to, to say something. Hello. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, I'm Roger Gilabert. I've been the coordinator for the iRead project in Spain for the uh, last four and a half years, um, uh, out of which two have happened in schools. We have integrated Navigo and uh, the other application on reading uh, Amigo um, in our classes uh, for um, two academic years. And um, children have been playing one hour per week uh, as part of their training in Spanish as novice readers and also EFL um, um, in grade six. Um, and they have been playing one, once per week. Uh, about motivation, what I wanted to say is that yes, the, the games have worked, they have loved them. Um, this combination of emotion challenges, you have to think that it's not only the challenge of the game, but there's also the challenge of the language because this was, this was language-based games and they have worked fabulously. And of course, rewards have worked very, very well. Simple as they are, you know, they are just pieces of clothing in most cases and, and they just love them. And, and, and it has worked uh, uh, fabulously. They, share, they, they shared what they had gotten with others. So it's been a, 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 a motivation for interaction also. But what I wanted to add to what has been said already is that um, it was uh, highly motivating for students that um, 
that were struggling with reading and that were st uh, struggling with language in general. Uh, for example, we had some newcomers to our country who still didn't master our languages and all of a sudden they were you know, playing the games um, like anybody else in the class. Uh, even if they didn't master the language as well as the, as the others, right? And and that was a source of inter integration and motivation for learn. So going back to what Kevin Davidson said before about it's just they are not just happening happening uh, you know in a void. They are happening in a in a social context, and they have been uh, extremely meaningful. So good. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Roser. Thank you for sharing this. Would anyone else like to add to, to this uh, discussion on motivation? I think Kevin's got his hand up, Mina. Oh, it's going down again. I, no, I, was, was, I, was, just, I was just clapping, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay, well, if there are no other um, stories, perhaps we can move on to our last and, and final topic. Hey, thanks, Lena. Just share my slides again. So our last question considers how games can foster learning and how we can evidence this. So learning games can target the development of generic skills like creativity, media literacy, problem solving, or domain specific skills like geometry, reading, Games used in the classroom tend to be um, domain specific. So this includes Navigo, which targeted reading skill acquisition and practice. Again, there's mixed evidence. Despite all the hype around learning games within the literature and beyond, there's still very, um, very mixed evidence for that actual benefit for learning. Research has shown some positive results. For instance, in a widely cited paper, Clark and colleagues compared the use of digital games and non-game conditions and found there was effectiveness in the games in supporting learning. However, it did depend on the particular features of the game. Uh, more recently, within the context of second language acquisition, um, Aqua and Cats found a positive impact of digital games on that area. The literature is um, quite scattered and not all researchers acknowledge the breadth breadth of the area or the range of application, which means that some evidence may be overlooked or not taken into account. And also there's issues with existing published research around game-based learning that could impact the reliability or validity of the conclusions. So um, differences with the comparison groups, um, issues with the validity of research instruments, uh, not sharing the full um, details of studies, things like that. And capitalizing on the learning potential of games can require um, a range of things like cross-disciplinarity uh, within schools, longer class durations, mixed student groups, etc., which all can be problematic to incorporate within typical classroom setups. During our final pilot interviews, a year two teacher reflected on how she expected the learning potential of Navigo to be measured and that she thought it would result in conclusive evidence to demonstrate this by the end of our pilot. But in reality, the research outcomes were more complicated than this, and therefore it did not enable firm conclusions to be made about the effectiveness of the game. So what is the impact on learning that can be evidenced given the characteristics of the classroom? Research requires particular frequency, consistency of use, uh, which has been a particular challenge for us due to a global pandemic happening in the middle of our pilot. Um, also, there are challenges in isolating the game from other aspects of learning, um, particularly in the case of reading skills, which are, are being tackled from lots of different angles. So where does the Navigo game come into it in our case? It's worth considering the role uh, randomised control trials could play uh, in motivating the use of games in the classroom. Do we need more of this kind of research? It's often seen as a gold standard, but is an expensive, time-consuming form of research. 
it is being funded more and more though in the UK, the Education Endowment Foundation um, takes this kind of approach in its research. In the meantime, how do teachers select promising games and evidence the success of use? We found that some teachers were happy with trusting the UCL branding of the Navigo game, seeing that this was an indication of quality. Well, what other tools are there for evidence in um, the impact on learning outcomes? One of the things that we've started to do is develop a learning analytics dashboard to help with this. So this shows various stats about the student use of the games and also areas where they need further support. But more research is needed to establish how this could be best used by teachers. And it's an area that some of our colleagues in the project are gonna be looking into further. So now I would like to invite um, Stephanie Harris, who already has introduced herself, and I think her colleague, um, Marina L. Flowerdew, who are both year two teachers at Europa School in Oxfordshire and have been involved um, in the IRE project this year to share their, some of their experiences in this area. So over to you, Stephanie and Marie Noel. Can I just check if Marie Noel would like to speak first, maybe? Or... Yeah. Shall I go? I can't hear Marie Noel very well. Can you, Laura? Can you hear me, Stephanie? Uh, it's, Can it's quite it's quite slow. Let's try again and see. Uh, turn your video off. I would try because we can't see you anyway. Can you hear me? Yeah, better. Marie Noel. Oh, okay. So so let me let me start. Yeah. Oh, can we hear you now? Can you hear me now? I've turned yes. off my video. Yes, yeah. we can. I'm switching off my microphone for now. Okay. So. Stephanie at Europa School. Stephanie works with, we're both the, um, the teachers who teach on the English side of the week. Um, Stephanie works with the Spanish class and I work with uh, the German class on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday morning and the French class on Wednesday afternoon, Thursday and Friday. Um, so how can we evidence children's learning outcomes from playing learning games such as Navigo? Um, what was interesting was that with lockdown this year, very much that was very much on our minds when we started to uh to you know when we when we decided to integrate navigo into our classroom practice because after year one where the children were coming up um you know with with quite low reading results we were very keen especially with two and a half days of the week in which to teach english we were quite keen to make sure that you know, whatever we were going to give priority would actually have an impact. So Navigo was one of a range of tools that we put into place this year to try to boost the, the children's um, reading. And as, the, as the, I started the project earlier than Stephanie, um, and about half a term earlier than Stephanie, and and actually, we ended up using it in different ways. So I'm going to hand over to Stephanie and she, she can talk for, for her. Uh, what I found quite useful was being able to be in contact with, with the, the Navigo team to actually talk about what we were hoping to get out of it. So really, the, the way that we could evidence the children's learning outcomes from it was, was using uh, Tableau. So, you know, feedback from, from the program itself. The thing that I found using it though, is that uh, I was using Navigo in a whole class context um, while I would listen to my, um, my individual readers or um, when I was running phonic support catch-up programs for uh, the children who didn't pass the year one's phonics test, which happened in November of, um, of year two. 
So the children were very much playing at their own level. We have a class teaching assistant, and and I would I would um, troubleshoot as well if the children had had problems with it. But that's how it was being used. And when I went to see Tableau, when Mina came in to to show me Tableau, what was interesting about that is because children would sort of skip around within the games. I didn't really, if they, if they came back to the same phonetical pattern, what seemed to happen when they played three games was there was a bit of a, according to Tableau, a bit of a, you know, patchy, patchy response to that. So, so in terms of feedback from, from Tableau, it would be a very, there are so many aspects to that, which I think are really interesting as a teacher to to explore. But but I don't think that having it for, for the children playing on it for half an hour a week, which is what I could dedicate to it, was going to provide me with the sort of data that 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 could be more useful um, if they played it a little bit more. Stephanie, do you want to explain how? for you because yes, you did thank it you, Marie -Noël. thank you so so i work with marino ellen and in fact i have done some things uh, very similarly to marino ellen and some slightly differently um the the the, the volume the quantity uh, i guess the amount of time the children have used navigo has been very similar just again because we have so little time so it's probably ended up being 20 to half an hour uh per week at the end of the week and it was the children's reward it used to be golden time when they they have some games that they can play but since introducing navigo i mean navigo has taken over golden time like the children have completely forgotten what golden time was and they wouldn't go back if they had the choice they would continue with navigo that's how much they love it so about 20 minutes to half an hour uh, as a class, so everybody and I would I would do something very similar to Marie Noël. That would be a time when I can manage to um, listen to some readers or to those little bits that we can do in 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 that much time. Um, and the, and everybody would play as a class. Um, I think what I did differently to Marie Noël, I think I believe, is that every week I assigned games in the in the um, software which were consistent with what we learned that week so if we learned adverbs i would pick a couple of games relating to adverbs and i would also choose some of the phonics that we had been working that week with my support group those children who did not pass the phonic screening um and so so that that's the way i worked um and that means that by the end of the year, when, when we, we needed to reflect on, oh, did Navigo, do we have any evidence? How, how, what, what do we notice in the data? And I looked in Tableau in, in the, the dashboard that Mina and Laura put together. Uh, well, I, I think it's explained that by that, but not necessarily, I guess. Uh, but we, as, as Marie Noël said, we, we saw, we, we couldn't really draw any conclusions. As much as I would have loved to say, oh, look, the data is going up, the curves are going up for, for children. Um, that's not what we noticed. But reflecting upon it with the team, with the Navigo team, obviously the fact that I was changing the games every week changing it and i guess making it harder for them because every time the children had to do something different would explain why i couldn't show uh, i could i couldn't show the positive curve that i would have liked to see um but then again thinking back you know i think the way i guess the way i did it felt you know um kind of gave me a little bit of confidence that i was controlling a little bit what the children were doing, that it was consistent with what we were uh, doing in class. So it could have been done differently, like Marie Noël, I think, didn't necessarily assign games and let them play freely. Um, but but um, but this is yeah, this is the way it was done, and I guess this is what I observed. So so for, yeah. so for me, actually, in terms of assessment, I didn't necessarily use Tableau 
to help me with the reading assessment. I, I lent on the standards methods that, that I use to typically assess the children's learning. So um, things like, for example, uh, every half term, I do a sort of individual running record where I listen to every child read independently and, and you know, book band based on their fluency and their, and their ability at, at doing that. Then there are the external summative assessments, such as the phonic tests and the, um, although we, we don't have to do uh, SATs this year, we have nevertheless used the SATs at the end of the year just to be able to actually benchmark after what's the second, um, you know, lockdown year in a row for this particular year band so that we could actually, you know, see see what their attainment is, is like prior to going into key stage two so that we can inform the teachers of, of key stage two as planning really on, on what to teach. Also, actually in reading, we use, you know, as, as most teachers, assessment for learning and reading as well, which basically when you, shows you which area, you know, which, which areas you, you're needing to focus on next in reading as well as actually external assessments provided by specialists such as speech therapists or, or I've got a child in my French class who's just come back with, a, with, a, with an educational assessment for dyslexia which has quite specific recommendations about um, sound patterns to, to teach her within that. So those are the different ways that we typically uh, use to uh, assess learning. And, and how do our assessments connect to the game? Well, for example, in Stephanie's case, it's actually, um, and also, but Laura was doing this for me when we were in the lockdown in January and February, which was that uh, having just conducted the phonic um, tests in November, we'd, we'd created, or the Stephanie actually created uh, a, a phonics program that we were teaching the children um, over lockdown online where the specific children who hadn't passed their phonics tests were were given extra uh, phonics lessons and Navigo then, so Laura was putting it for my class, but Stephanie was putting it for, for her own class. We were, the sounds that were being taught to those children were then, those children were singled out for those particular sounds so that they would revisit them. And also during lockdown, um, we used Navigo as one of uh, a battery of, of reading supports for the children. So they were, there was a program called Lelilo that we used and, and um, Active Learn, so Bug Club that we used and alongside Navigo as well. And we really, we found that, ha and plus we said to the children, and read a book for pleasure as well. But what that meant from a, from a technology point of view is that one program had reading books that the children were able to listen to as well as read aloud. Another program was, the Lelilo one was very, very specific about phonics, but Navigo filled the gap actually for engagement. It was definitely really, really up there for engagement. And in fact, to the point that, that the children emptied out their rewards and loot boxes <laughs> in our school because they were, you know, they were really very heavily into it. So, so what it did was it generated an interest in reading uh, for the children. And particularly, actually, when they when they came back, I've I, I noticed that it's facilitated syntax in particular. So, you know, that that was a gap that was missing in the other two programs that I think, you know, Navigo Navigo picked up. So so broadly speaking, it, it just felt as though from a technology point of view, we really had we had all of the bases covered. And Navigo was was definitely for you know for word decoding for syntax it was it was excellent for for us. That sounds a really good um, endorsement. Well done, Laura and Mina. Well, also actually in terms of progress, just so you have an overview in my French class, because I've measured you know I've measured obviously their reading progress from September until now. 
I'm not less I'm not talking attainment here I'm talking progress of the children in my French class 12 have made outstanding progress 10 have made good progress five have made expected progress uh, out of the 28 and in my German class there were 10 who've made outstanding progress nine who've made good progress eight at the expected progress and one who's made low progress so I just you know it's as a as a as a sort of battery of things as part of the arsenal that we put in to try to raise our reading standards you know this this year it's i think that navigo definitely played a role within that i'm sorry once again i apologize my broadband went down i can't believe it's happened at this time um however I'm conscious of time, so but it's worth asking if there is any more questions. There are one or two things going on in the chat, which is a quite worth looking at. But has anybody got any further questions before we ask Laura and Mina for their final comments? Laura, Mina, do you want to wind up with your final yeah. comments? OK, great. Well, many thanks to uh, all the teachers and uh, attendees who contributed to this discussion. And also, as I think uh, has become evident, the Navigo game and everything that has gone around it, including the, the uh, dashboard we were discussing before, has been a contribution from a very wide team of people with many expertise. So I wanted to thank our wider team as well. And so just a few closing remarks. Um, if you can, Laura, move to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to very quickly take the opportunity to highlight uh, some of the key findings that we've had uh, from some of the studies that I think are pertinent in different ways to the discussions we've been having here. So, for example, as our German partner um, looked at how Navigo um, when it's used by children uh, to practice one particular skill, what are the learning outcomes that come out of this? So what they found is that after a certain number of uh, trials and practice, there are transferable learning outcomes to writing and reading as evidence of learning, suggesting then that kind of connecting to what we've been discussing so far is that in many ways to capitalize on these benefits of games, uh, systematic and sort of repeated use is uh, uh, very useful. Another study that we um, led at UCL showed that children who struggled to read were not able to understand the hints that are provided in the game in order to recover from uh, the error. And what we found in subsequent work is that when there is external instruction and pre-teaching, that seems to facilitate children's use of the in-game feedback as well. And then one uh, study that was uh, recently published by our partners uh, in Spain, uh, Roger's team, who was also contributing today, was looking at what happens in relation to uh, learning outcomes when a teacher selects the game sequences for Navigo versus letting the personalized uh, approach take the lead. So which one is, is better? Are there any differences? And one of the things they seem to have found is that the students who struggle the most are the ones who benefit also the most from the personalization uh, as the game keeps giving them content that supports them in the areas they need repeated practice in. So if you want to look more at these publications, they can be found under our website. Um, so to kind of close off, thank you, Laura. So what's next for us? Um, we're looking at opportunities at the moment to license Navigo and form partnerships with industry in collaboration with our partner, Fish in the Bottle, and uh, Drew, uh, who, was, who was contributing to the discussion today. We also look forward to publishing a lot of what we learned about the process of teacher's appropriation of Navigo and foregrounding some of the complexities of what it means to bring technology in the background to inform not only practice, but also policy. So with this, I just wanted to thank everyone for attending. 
and also the teachers in particular, and all of the wonderful students who have uh, been playing Navigo for the past two years and have made this project such a worthwhile experience for, for our whole team. So thank you, everyone. Laura, do you have anything to say or is that... We let um, me... No, just to join me in the thanks and we let, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. been a lot of work, four and a half years and so <laughs> Um, yeah, we're very happy to kind of got to the end of it with such uh, yeah positive results and lovely stories to hear from everybody. So thank you all for joining us today. Brilliant. Well, hope hope you manage to get people to make it really commercially viable and get it widely used. So thank you to everybody. Thank you for your patience with the uh, old technology. It sometimes fails. Um, but thank you to Peter and Caroline from Learners who actually set the whole thing up and um, done all the work behind the scenes. And I thank you everybody for your contributions. So enjoy the rest of your evening and the weather looks good where I am. I hope it is for you. Thank you. <laughs>